I'm often asked what skills are most important to go from being a good player to an expert one. Perhaps one of the most underrated and least commonly used skills is the ability to change your game to fit a certain game type. That is, to change gears to exploit the mistakes your opponents make. The money you make in poker comes from your opponent's mistakes. If you can identify those errors, you can manipulate your opponents so that they make more mistakes and so that the mistakes they make are more costly. Learning to do that well will prove to be very profitable. In general, your goal when you adjust to a certain game type is to encourage your opponent's mistakes. Some opponents play too passively. They don't raise it often enough. You take advantage of that by betting more. For example, if you have an opponent that plays too loosely, plays too many hands, you adjust to that by betting more of your weaker hands. Against a player who folds too much, you should bet more not to get him to call with weaker hands, but to get him to fold better ones. In this show, I will introduce two player and game types, loose and passive, and weak type. There are other player and game types that you'll encounter, but these two are particularly profitable, and they also exercise different skill sets, so they're valuable to study. By learning to adjust to these game types, you'll learn the process by which you can adjust to any game type. Okay, let's look at the running order of the show. First, we'll do the theory section. We'll look at a loose and passive game in three parts. Pre-flop, the flop and turn, and then the river. That is, we'll look at each betting round in turn. We'll learn that you can play more hands before the flop, you should bet for value more often after the flop, but you should semi-bluff less. In the tight and passive game, we'll also look at it in three parts. Pre-flop, the flop and turn, and the river. And we'll learn that you can again play more hands, but that you should bet for value less and semi-bluff more. Then we'll put the theory into practice by working through a series of examples where we can take all the knowledge we've learned and put it together. So first, the loose and passive games. In loose and passive games, you'll have many multi-way pots. Your opponents will play hands they shouldn't, and often you'll see the flop four, five, six-handed. Few people will raise, so often you'll be able to slip in for one bet in late position with a weak hand. Generally, your opponents call too often. They call too often before the flop with weak hands, and then they call too often after the flop as well with weak draws and even basically no draw at all. You take advantage of this by betting more of your weaker hands. For example, hands that are, would be too weak to bet for value against a better playing opponent are fine to bet for value against a loose and passive player because the loose player will call with many more hands and the passive player won't raise you with his better ones. One thing to notice about loose and passive games is that you'll see the showdown far more often because at least one of several players will usually call all the way to the end. So because of that, hand values become more important in that you can't rely on trying to bluff people very often. So you really need good hands at the end to make money. So in our discussion of loose and passive games, we're going to break it down. And we're first going to talk about adjustments you make before the flop. Then we'll talk about adjustments you make on the flop and turn. And then we'll talk about adjustments you make on the river. There are a few important adjustments before the flop. The first is that hands with post-flop strategic advantages gain value, especially hands like small suited connectors and small pairs. The reason is that you're going to get paid off more after the flop if you make your hand, so the implied odds of those hands go up. So if you have pocket threes, for instance, in a typical game, you might expect to make only a few more bets after the flop if you make your set. Whereas in a loose and passive game, you can expect to make several more bets beyond that because several players will call you down with weaker hands. Likewise, with a small suited connector, if you make a flush or a straight, you can expect to get action on your hand. Because of that, you can play some hands from early position that you wouldn't play otherwise in a more typical game. You can play small pairs, like pocket fours, or you could play a hand like a6 suited. The reason you don't play those hands in a typical game is because if you come in, it might be raised and re-raised behind you, and it might cost you two or three bets to see the flop. Since those hands tend to have a pot equity disadvantage, against people who might be raising and re-raising you, those two or three bets cost you money before the flop. You have to make up for those bets if you make your hand after the flop, 
but against good and typical players, you may not make enough after the flop to compensate for those bets. Against loose passive players, though, it's okay because, first, they won't raise very often before the flop because they're passive. So if they have a hand like pocket tens, they might just limp in rather than punish you by raising. Also, they tend to call too often after the flop. So if you flop a set with, say, pocket threes, they might call you with just overcards, whereas a better player might not. The second adjustment you should make is that you should raise more liberally than you would in a typical game. That's because your opponents are playing hands that are much weaker than average, so all of your hands gain pot equity advantage. So hands that would not have a pot equity advantage against typical players will have a pot equity advantage against these bad players. For instance, say two people limp in and you're on the button with ace-10 offsuit. Against typical players, you might not raise because those first two limps are usually going to be with a decent hand, and they might even be with a hand that has you dominated, like ace-jack or ace-queen. At the very least, they'll probably have something decent, like pocket sevens, eight-seven suited, some hands against which ace-ten is not a big favorite. But loose and passive players will have all kinds of hands. They could have ten-four suited, they could have king-nine offsuit, they could have even worse hands. The worse your opponent's hands, the bigger the pot equity advantage you have. So while against typical players, ace-10 offsuit on the button wouldn't have an advantage, against loose and passive players it would. Another adjustment you can make is that you can play even more loosely than you normally would on the button for just one bet. Since loose and passive players, again, don't raise often enough, and because they pay off with too many hands after the flop, you can really lower your starting requirements. For instance, say a couple people limp in. You should definitely limp if you have something like jack-7 suited. That hand isn't very good, and you won't often flop a strong hand, but when you do, you can expect to be paid off more than enough to compensate for those times that you don't make your hand. There's also a couple adjustments to make on the flop and turn. The first main adjustment to make is when in doubt, bet. A lot of hands that you might check against a typical player, because a typical player is tricky, might check raise you, or what have you, you can just bet with impunity against a loose player because they'll call you too often and they won't raise you enough. Loose and passive players have worse hands than you expect them to have. In fact, they have worse hands than you could possibly imagine anyone having. They'll call with one overcard. They'll call with no overcards, no draw, no anything. Who knows why they do it, but they do. And the only way to take advantage of that is by betting. Also, since they're passive, they won't raise you often enough when they have a good hand. The downside to betting is that it opens you up to a raise. But if your opponents don't raise often enough, then you can bet more and get away with it. This is especially true in late position because loose and passive players generally don't check raise unless they have a very strong hand. So if everybody checks to you in a loose and passive game and you're on the button, you can bet and almost all the time you won't be check raised because only those times someone has an absolute monster can you expect to be check raised. Let's look at an example. So you've got the ace of hearts, queen of spades on the button. And two people have limped in. So naturally you raise. The big blind calls and the two limpers call. The flop comes, jack of diamonds, seven of hearts, five of spades. Everybody checks to you. You should bet. The flop is ragged, may have missed everybody. And even if somebody does have a good hand, you're unlikely to get raised. That gives you a chance to catch an ace or a queen on the turn. So you bet, and two people call. The turn is a five. So it didn't help you, but it probably didn't help your opponents either, unless they happen to have a five. They check to you. You should actually bet again. Against two typical players, two calls on that flop, jack, seven, five, would probably mean someone had flopped a pair. But against loose and passive players, you really can't assume that. They'll call with all sorts of hands on the flop. They'll call with ace-3, they'll call with king-9, they'll call with a gut shot. Well, they should call with a gut shot, but in any event, they'll call with a lot of hands that aren't a pair. Ace-queen may still be the best hand, and you should protect it by betting. In general, don't fear calls from loose and passive players. Loose and passive players call with all sorts of things. They call when they have good hands, they call when they have bad hands. So just because they called really doesn't mean much at all. They could have the same bad hand that they started with. Don't be afraid just because they called. Even if your hand isn't great, that doesn't mean that you should stop betting. 
Again, against good players, betting a marginal hand can be dangerous, because you tend only to get calls from good hands, so you won't get value from the weaker hands that a loose player will call you with. And good players will raise you more often, which may force you to lay two to one. That is, you're only making one bet if you have the best hand, but if he raises, then you're paying off two to his best hand. To do that, you need a stronger hand. But loose passive players don't do either of those things. They don't raise their good hands, and they call with all sorts of bad ones. So don't try to outwit loose and passive players by betting your good hands and checking your bad ones. The main mistake they make is calling too often, and the best way to exploit it is just to keep betting. Let them hang themselves on your bets. In fact, you don't even have to win half the time you bet to make your bets worthwhile, because there's money in the pot, so your bets protect your hand. So don't be shy about betting against loose and passive players. That's definitely the way to beat them. So generally, against loose and passive players, you should bet more often. There is one kind of hand, though, that you should actually bet less often against loose and passive players. If you have a weak draw, like say a gut shot, you might bet it as a semi bluff against typical or tight players. But against loose and passive players, it generally doesn't make much sense to bet your gut shot unless you have some showdown value to go along with it. For instance, say two players limp, and you limp on the button with the ten of clubs, eight of clubs. The blinds call, and the flop comes king, nine, six. So you have a gut shot uh, with ten, nine, eight, six. Everybody checks to you. Against good players, especially against only, say, one or two of them, you would bet as a semi-bluff, because they checked, which means they may have missed the flop entirely, and you could pick the pot up. Against loose and passive players, though, they're likely to call you even if they did miss the flop. The problem is that you don't have a hand to show down, so when they're calling you, they actually happen to be correct to do so this time, even though they're usually making a mistake. So on the flop and turn, the main adjustment you make is that you bet more hands, particularly your weaker hands like pairs and even ace high that you might check against a better player. The reason you bet them is because they'll call with weaker hands and they won't raise you as often as they should. The one exception is, if you have a weak draw that doesn't have any showdown value, like a gut shot, then you should often check when you would have bet against better players as a semi-bluff, because you're not likely to get everyone to fold. On the river, the same principle applies. You bet more hands. Particularly, you bet more marginal pairs for value. Here's an example. So one player limps, and you raise on the button with pocket tens. Big blind calls and the limper calls. Both these players are loose and passive. Flop comes queen, seven, five, rainbow. Your opponents check, you bet, and they both call. So what do they have? Well, they could have a queen, but they could also have a seven or five. In addition, they could have any number of other hands. Since they're loose and passive, they could have a gut shot, say nine, eight, or they could even have all sorts of other hands, like ace high, ace four. They could have king jack. They could even have 10 dudes. No sane person would call with 10 dudes, either before the flop or on the flop, but your opponents are loose and passive, and they tend to call with hands they shouldn't. Anyway, the fact that your two opponents have called doesn't tell you a whole lot about their hands. Remember, don't fear loose and passive players just because they call. Anyway, the turn comes another five. Your opponents check, and you should bet again. You're betting to protect your hand, because overcards could come, an ace, a king, or a jack, and you don't want your opponents to catch a free card to beat you. Also, you have no reason to believe you don't still have the best hand. Five came, so anyone with a five now beats you, but your opponents could have so many hands, you can't fear the five and check. So you bet, the big blind folds and the limper calls. The river's a nine and your opponent checks. Well, what could your opponent have? He probably doesn't have a 5, because he didn't check Reggie on the turn. He could have a queen, but if so, he's even for a loose and passive player, he's played it pretty passively. He never raised at any point. But he could have a queen. He could also have a 7. He could have a pocket pair, smaller than yours, like pocket 6s or pocket 3s. He could have ace high, king high, and again, he could still have 10 high. Now, he probably won't call you with 10 high, but he'll probably call you with ace high, and he'll certainly call you if he has a 7 or a smaller pocket pair. Chances are your 10s are still the best hand, and even when he calls, you will be the favorite. So you should bet for value.
Against the tight player, you might not bet there, because the tight player might have only called you on the turn with a queen. So now you know the important adjustments to make when your opponents are loose and passive. First, you play more hands before the flop, particularly those with high implied odds like small pairs and suited aces. You raise more because your opponents' are hands are weaker than average, so you have a pot equity advantage with more of your hands. You should bet more after the flop, particularly when your hand has showdown value. Because often your opponents will have just a weak draw and no showdown value, and you need to protect your hand. When you don't have showdown value, often you should take a free card where you might bluff or semi-bluff against better players. Finally, bet your marginal hands for value on the river because your opponents will call with weaker hands. So let's put all those principles to work with two example hands. Okay, in the first example, two players limp, the small blind calls, and you're in the big blind with queen three offsuit, so you check. The flop comes queen ten five rainbow, so you flop top pair. Small blind checks, so you bet you got top pair, there's two players, and they might call you with bad hands. Both limpers do call, and the small blind folds. The turn is a deuce, which puts two spades on board. You bet, and one of the limpers calls. The river is a king. Against the tighter player, you might check. Because what could a tighter player have? Well, on the flop, it was queen 10 5, and he called so he could have a pair, maybe queens, maybe tens, maybe fives. He could have a gut shot, king 9, or he could just have a regular straight jaw with king jack or jack 9. But when he calls again on the turn, after a deuce comes, that limits his hands. He probably doesn't have a 5 anymore, because he'd probably let that go. He also probably doesn't have a gut shot with king 9. So to call on the turn, he probably has a decent pair, queen or a 10. Or perhaps he's got a straight draw, king jack, jack 9. When the river's a king, that's a bad card. Because now you're behind if he had a straight draw. King jack makes a pair, and jack 9 makes a straight. If he has a queen, you're probably behind because his kicker probably beats yours. So really, you're hoping he has a 10. If you bet, you might well get raised because he made his straight. And even if you don't get raised, you'll probably get called by a better hand. On the other hand, against a loose and passive player, you should definitely bet. Loose and passive player would call with all sorts of hands. On the flop, turn, and river. He'd call with any pair, any pair of fives, pair of tens, pair of deuces. He could have a pocket pair, pair of fours. He could have ace high. He could have any of a number of hands. Your pair of queens is pretty good against the range of hands a loose and passive player could have, whereas it's not good at all against what a tight player would have. So since your opponent is loose and passive, you make a more aggressive bet on the river with your marginal pair of queens. So now let's look at a second example. So you're under the gun with pocket eights, and you call. Two players limp behind you, the small blind folds, and the big blind checks. All your opponents are loose and passive. Flop comes nine of spades, five of spades, two of hearts. So there's a flush draw on board, and you have a pair just smaller than the top pair. Everybody checks to you, so you bet. You're betting because your hand is vulnerable, and it's quite likely that you have the best hand. As long as no one has a 9, you're in good shape. Unfortunately, everybody calls. The turn comes the queen of hearts. Everybody checks to you, and what do you do? Well, you bet. Remember, against loose and passive players, the adjustment you make is you bet more of your marginal hands, particularly the ones with showdown value. You're not going to get check-raised as often, and you're going to get calls from weaker hands more than you would against others. So you bet, and this time only one player calls. The river cards the four of clubs. Your opponent checks. What should you do? Well, again, against the tighter player, you should probably check it down. What could a tighter player be calling you with? We could have a flush draw with two spades, but at that point, the, his flush is missed, and he probably won't call you. He could have a pair, but if he has a pair, he's more likely to have a bigger one, because he's a tighter player, and a queen or a nine both beat you. So the chances that he has a pair, and that you have him beaten, and that he'll call you are clearly less than 50%, so you should probably check it down. Against the loose player, you should definitely bet, because he's just as likely to have a small pair as he is a big one, and he could even have worse hand, like ace high and call you. Since your opponent could have more hands that you beat with pocket eights than those that beat you, you should bet and hope to be called. 
The next game type we're going to talk about are weak tight games. Weak tight players have some familiarity with poker concepts. They know you should play tight before the flop. They know about pot odds and implied odds. So when they have a weak draw like a gut shot, they'll call when the pot is large and they'll fold when it's too small. The main mistake that weak tight players make is that they give their opponents too much credit when they better raise. That is, they assume their opponents have better hands than they actually do. That causes weak tight players to call when they should raise and to fold when they should call. You take advantage of that mistake by playing more hands before the flop than you would otherwise, and by betting more strongly, particularly semi-bluffs, after the flop. Another change you make is that you don't bet nearly as often for value, especially on the river. To sum up the strategy for beating a weak tight game, you have to run over the table. You're going to raise and bet often trying to force your weak tight opponents off their hands. Again, we're going to analyze pre-flop changes, then adjustments you make on the flop and turn, and finally adjustments you make on the river. Pre-flop, you can play a lot more hands in a weak tight game than you would in a normal game. Your opponents don't raise enough, and raising is what prevents you from playing marginal hands. Particularly when you're in late position, you should play a lot more hands. Here's an example. A weak tight player limps to you, and everybody else folds to you on the button. You have king-9 offsuit. Normally, you'd never play king-9 offsuit outside the blinds. It's, it's not a strong enough hand. There are some situations in a shorthanded game. You might play it, but usually you're not going to play the hand. In a weak tight game, though, you might raise with it. Raising before the flop serves two purposes in a weak tight game. First, you may get the blinds to fold hands that they shouldn't. Second, it makes the pot bigger and punishes your opponent's tendency to fold on later betting rounds. For instance, say there's four bets in the pot and your opponent folds. Maybe he's making a small mistake. But now if there's eight bets in the pot and he folds the same hand, he's making a much bigger mistake than he was before. The bigger the pot, the worse a bad fold is. Since your opponents tend to make bad folds, you should make the pot bigger to punish them. So coming back to our example, you have king nine offsuit on the button. One limber to you, and you should probably raise. The big blind might fold. And when the limper calls, he might fold on the flop, even if you miss. For example, if the flop comes, say, queen, eight, four, right, and he checks and you bet. If he missed the flop, even if he's got ace high, he's likely to fold. That's a bad fold, it turns out, because your hand isn't so good. But his weak tight tendency will make him fold those hands that he shouldn't. Therefore, raising before the flop has caused your opponent to fold more often and has made his fold worse because the pot's bigger. Here's another example. One weak tight player limps in, and you've got 6-5 suited on the button. Now, 6-5 suited is not a very good hand shorthanded. It has no showdown value. But in a weak tight game, showdown value isn't so important because often you don't even get to the showdown. You can bet your opponents off their hand before it even gets that far. So in a weak tight game, it's worthwhile to limp in with a hand like 6-5 suited, hoping A, you get lucky if your opponents happen to make a hand, but B, you're just going to get them to fold after the flop very often. If the flop comes something like jack, jack, seven, everybody checks to you and you bet, you're often going to pick up the pot, even though you don't have anything. Weak tight players allow you to play weak hands on the button because they'll fold to you and you'll never have to show your hand out. Now, why do you play more hands in unraised pots against weak tight players? When your weak tight opponents raise, you need to be a lot more careful. Particularly, when you're in the big blind, you should surrender some hands that you would play against aggressive raisers. Examples might be ace-10 offsuit or even king-queen offsuit. When a weak tight player raises, he'll often have a very premium hand, a big pocket pair, or perhaps ace-king. Against those hands, ace-10 offsuit and king-queen offsuit are in big, big trouble. Now, even though your weak tight opponents tend to fold too often after the flop, when they have truly premium hands like big pairs, they're going to call you down too often to make calling with hands like ace-10 and king-queen profitable. So when a weak tight player raises, you should certainly fold in the blinds if you have one of those hands. The third adjustment to make preflop is one we've already talked about a little bit, but we should bring out on its own. Raise more often. Raising does three things. One is it gets the blinds to fold hands that they sometimes shouldn't. Two is it tends to scare the other players who take the flop with you and forces them to try to hit the flop or else they're going to fold. That is, if a weak tight player has a hand like ace-10, limps in and gets raised, unless he flops an ace or a 10, usually he's going to fold. Now, loose and passive players don't do that. 
But weak tight players do fold, and the fact that you've raised will encourage him to do so. Finally, raising increases the size of the pot, and when your opponents make bad folds, the bigger the pot, the worse their folds. Remember, your adjustments are trying to exploit the mistakes your opponents naturally make. Since your opponents fold too much, you want to raise the pot and force them off their hands. Now let's move on to flop and turn adjustments. Like in the loose passive players, the main adjustment you make is you need to bet. Bet, bet, bet against weak tight players. They fold too often, and they can't fold if you don't bet. So you should bet weak hands, bet strong hands, bet over and over again. Particularly, you should bluff and semi-bluff more often. If you flop a gut shot, you flop a flush draw, you flop a backdoor flush draw, an overcard, you flop something, you semi-bluff with it, because they're going to fold so often that you don't have to have much value to make it worth bluffing. Let's look at an example. It's folded to you in middle position, and you have queen-jack suited. So you raise, and both the blinds, who are weak tight players, call. The flop comes 10-8-4 with two hearts. So you flop a gut shot and two overcards, but there's a flush draw on board, and you don't have the flush suit. Your opponents check, you bet, and only the big blind calls. The turn is a blank, the two of diamonds. Your opponent checks. Against the tricky or more aggressive player, you might check behind. Because checking allows you to try to catch a 9, a queen, or jack on the river for free. And tricky opponents might check raise you. But not against a weak tight opponent. Against weak tight players, you should certainly bet. Because your bet is likely to force him off his hand if he had a 4, or an 8, or a smaller pocket pair. Weak tight players tend to take one off on the flop even with hands that aren't that good. But then on the turn, they'll give up. They're not going to call you down with a weak pair. So when he calls you on the flop, that doesn't mean he's committed to calling you down forever. And you should certainly take another shot at the pot by betting. The second important flop and turn adjustment is that you need to take raises more seriously. When weak tight players bet, that is, they make the first bet on the round, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a good hand. Sometimes they get out of line a little bit, sometimes they're getting a little frisky, and sometimes they're just trying to stand up to you because you keep betting at them. When they raise you, though, they tend to mean business. You have ace-queen offsuit in early position. You raise, and only a weak tight player in the big blind calls. The flop comes king of spades, jack of diamonds, four clubs. So you missed, and a king came, which is probably one of the worst cards that can come when you have ace-queen. But if the weak tight player in the big blind bets, you should consider raising, even though this flop is a bad one for you. Your raise is a semi-bluff. The reason why you're raising is that his bet really doesn't mean that much. He might have a king, but weak tight players often wouldn't bet a king. The fact that he's betting might mean that he has a weak hand and he's just trying to bluff himself. So if you raise, he might give up immediately. Now say instead of betting, he checks. You bet, and he raises. Now you should consider folding immediately. The weak tight player probably has a good hand, at least a king, and possibly two pair or a set. Your ace-queen is probably drawing thin or even dead. The third adjustment you should make is one that's useful against all players, but that is particularly useful against weak tight ones. You should use the cards on the board to help you read your opponent's hand. Since weak tight players play tightly, that is, they don't call very often, and they don't bet or raise very often either, the fact that they've called bet or raise generally narrows down their range of hands more than it would for a normal player. Let's look at an example. You open raise in middle position with king ten of hearts, and a weak tight player cold calls your raise. When a weak tight player cold calls, it could be a pretty good hand. Against a typically aggressive player, they would 3-bet with a wide range of hands, like including pocket jacks, tens, ace-king, even ace-queen. Weak tight players don't generally like to re-raise with those hands. They'll usually just call you. So if a weak tight player calls, it doesn't necessarily mean they have a good hand, but it's more likely than if a normal player cold calls you. Anyway, the weak tight player cold calls, the blinds fold, and the flop comes jack of diamonds, jack of spades, six of clubs. You bet, and the weak tight player calls. Now against the loose and passive player, you might even bet again on the turn. You have king high, and that might well be the best hand. 
A loose player could call on that flop with a number of hands. Ace high, queen high, ten high, but not a weak tight player. The weak tight player cold called before the flop, which might mean he has a good hand. And then he called on a flop that misses almost all hands, jack, jack, six. He has something. He's got a pocket pair. He maybe has a six. And he possibly even has a jack. In any event, your bluffing isn't going to go anywhere, and you should just give up on the turn. Another adjustment you should make is that on the turn, you should sometimes check down hand that you would normally bet against a loose player. These hands are ones that tend not to be vulnerable. If you have, say, a pair of aces or a pair of kings so that no overcard can come, and there's no obvious flush or straight draw on the board. If you have one of those hands, sometimes it's worth checking down if your hand isn't that strong, like say you have a pair of aces but with a very weak kicker. Let's look at a concrete example. Everybody folds to you on the button. You've got ace-five offsuit and you raise. Only the big blind, again a weak type player, calls. The flop comes ace-eight-eight. Eight. So you flopped a pair of aces, but there's a pair of eights on board, and you have no kicker. Your opponent checks and you bet. The weak tight player calls. Now again, a loose player calling on that board doesn't necessarily mean a lot. The loose player could have king, queen, or a small pocket pair. The weak tight player could have a pocket pair also, but it's much more likely, given that he called before the flop, and that he's calling on a flop of ace, eight, eight, that he's got at least an ace, and maybe even an eight. Anyway, the turn is a six. If your opponent checks, you should consider checking behind. You don't really give up much, because the pot's small, and it's unlikely, if you do have the best hand, that you'll be outdrawn. But if your opponent is being sneaky and has a better ace, or even an eight, you save some money because you don't get check-raised. So because your hand is not very vulnerable, the pot is small, and your opponent is weak-tight and therefore likely to have a better range of hands than an average player, you should probably check in situations like this. Another adjustment you can make on the flop and turn is that you can fold to a raise more often. Remember, weak-tight players can bet with a fairly wide range of hands, but when they raise, they usually mean business. Let's look at an example of a hand that you can fold to a weak tight player that you might not be able to fold to a more typical or aggressive player. You have pocket jacks in early position and you raise. Everybody folds to the weak tight big blind, who calls. The flop comes king of hearts, nine of hearts, seven of spades. Weak tight player checks. You bet, he raises. Against the typical player, you'd absolutely have to pay off, because he might be check-raising with any pair. If he flopped a 7 or a 9, he would probably check-raise you. Or if he flopped a flush draw with two hearts, he might well check-raise you. weak tight players generally don't do that. A weak tight player, if he check-raises you, again, likely has a good hand, like at least a king and possibly two pair or a set. With your pocket jacks, you're drawing to two outs against most of those hands, so you can probably just fold immediately. Again, this is an adjustment you should only make against weak tight players. If you start folding pocket jacks in those situations against everybody, you'll be the weak tight player. Now let's look at the river betting round. There's two major adjustments to make on the river, and they're roughly opposite which you would make against a loose passive player. Against a weak tight player, you should bet fewer hands than normal for value, because the weak tight player only calls with good hands. Loose passive players call with a lot of hands, so you can lower your standards and still get value. We tight players call with only a few hands, so you must raise your standards to accommodate. Let's look at an example. There's one limper to you, and you're on the button with ace-8 suited. Now against a weak tight player, this is a good spot to raise. You might intimidate the player, make the pot bigger, and knock out the big blind. Not this time, though, because the big blind calls and the limper calls as well. The flop is queen-8-6 with two spades, so that puts a flush draw on board that's not of your suit but it gives you middle pair. Your opponents check, and you bet. They might fold a better hand, it's not that likely, but you are quite likely to have the best hand with your pair of eights here, so you definitely should bet. The big blind folds, but the limper calls. The turn is the seven of hearts, so that completes a possible straight, but it doesn't complete the flush, and it puts a card smaller than your pair on board. The weak tight player checks. Now this is not a place where the principle that you should check down marginal hands against weak tight players on the turn applies. Because remember, that principle only applies when your hand is not very vulnerable. That is, if you have, say, a pair of aces or kings where no overcard can come. Here you have a pair of eights, so a lot of overcards could come. 
and your weak tight opponent could have any of those. So you really don't want to give him a free card. Additionally, if you bet he might even fold a better hand, like say he's got pocket tens. He checks, you bet, and he has to think, well, what do you have? Since he's a weak tight player, he's going to tend to give you more credit for a hand than you probably deserve. Since you bet on the flop, bet on the turn, he's going to think you probably have at least a queen. He may well fold pocket tens. That would be terrific for you. So anyway, the weak tight player checks, you bet, and he calls. The river is the deuce of clubs. Your opponent checks. You should definitely check this down. You have a pair of eights, and a weak tight player has called you twice, once on the flop and once on the turn. He either had a flush draw and missed, at which point he's not going to call you, or he's got a pretty good hand. He might have an eight, but it's quite likely that instead he has a queen, maybe queen jack or even king queen. He was too afraid to raise you because that's what weak tight players do. They give you too much credit for a hand, and they won't raise you with hands that are good, but not as good as the hands they think you might have. So if you bet your pair of eights and your opponent calls, you can expect to see a queen more than half the time, and you won't win the pot. Now against a loose player, again, remember, you'd probably bet this hand, because loose players could have any of the pairs, and your pair of eights would fare favorably against the range of hands they might call with. Weak tight players don't call very often, so you can't bet marginal hands for value. Against a loose passive player, remember the adjustments you make on the river is that you bet more hands for value, but you don't bluff nearly as often because they're less likely to fold. Just the opposite is true against a weak tight player. You bet fewer hands for value because their hands tend to be better, but you should bluff more often because it's more likely they're going to fold. So let's look at an example of extra bluffing. Two players limp, and you call in late position with 8-6 of clubs. Now this is a call you might make against anyone, but again against weak tight players you call more often with weaker hands. The reason is you don't see the showdown that often, so the value of your hand doesn't matter nearly as much. Anyway, the small blind folds, the big blind checks, and we see the flop. It's king of spades, seven of clubs, five of spades. So there's a flush draw on board, and you flopped an open-ended straight draw with your 8-6. The big blind bets. One player calls. You should raise. So when you raise here, you're doing it for two reasons. One is you're trying for a free card with your open-ended straight draw. If everybody calls and they check to you on the turn, you can check behind. Another reason is that it acts as a semi-bluff, because the better might not have that good a hand. He might, after your raise, simply decide to fold. Loose players generally would never do that. If they bet on a round or called, they're never going to fold for one more bet back. But weak tight players sometimes do. So when you raise, you get that extra value that you might get people to fold immediately. Back to the example. Now in the example, after you raise, the big blind does indeed fold. Remember, that does happen sometimes. But the caller calls. The turn is the three of clubs, giving you a flush draw, but not improving your hand otherwise. Your opponent checks, and now with your open-ended straight and flush draw, you certainly should take another shot at the pot. Weak tight players fold too much, give them a chance to fold. So you bet, he calls. The river's the jack of hearts, so you missed everything, and now you have eight high. Your opponent checks, and now you should absolutely bet. Against a loose player, you might not even bet here. You might give up. It might be obvious that he's got a pair, and he's going to call down. Not so against a weak tight player. Weak tight players may even fold a pair. They may give you too much credit for a hand since you bet on every round and may decide that their pair of fives or pair of sevens is no good. In any event, if you have a hand with no showdown value, the pot's reasonably big, and your opponent's weak tight, you should almost always take one last shot at the pot. Now let's put that theory into practice with a few exercises. For each exercise, I'll tell you what kind of game you're in, a loose passive one or a weak tight one. So first, you're in a weak tight game, one player limps, and you're one off the button with the ace of clubs, three of clubs. What should you do? Well, remember, in a weak tight game, you should generally raise more before the flop for three reasons. One is the big blind will tend to fold more, so you can get him out. Two is that limbers will tend to be more afraid of what you have and therefore be more likely to fold after the flop. And three, when you raise, you increase the size of the pot, so their folds after the flop are bigger mistakes. With ace-three suited, you have plenty of hand to try to take a shot and raise. 
Now another weak tight example. An early position player raises, and one player cold calls. It's folded to you in the big blind, and you have the jack of spades, ten of hearts, jack ten offsuit. What should you do? Remember, weak tight players fold too often, but they also don't raise very often before the flop. So the early position player's raise probably means he has a premium hand. In addition, the cold callers generally will have better hands than usual as well. It's quite unlikely that you'll be able to win after the flop without a showdown. So you should probably just fold. Now let's try an example from a loose passive game. You're under the gun, and you've got pocket threes. What should you do? Remember, in loose passive games, hands like pocket pairs and small suited connectors go up in value. In addition, you're not likely to get raised behind you, so you can usually slip in up front with the small pocket pairs. In a loose passive game, you should call. Let's try another loose passive one. You're under the gun again, but now this time you have 6-5 suited. What should you do? Before I said that small pairs and small suited connectors go up in value in a loose passive game, and that small pairs go up in value enough that it's worth calling with them from under the gun. Fortunately, small suited connectors really usually aren't strong enough to play from under the gun. So 6-5 suited should still be a fold. Now let's go back to a weak tight game. In this hand, a particularly tight player is in the blind, even tighter than average for this game. The first player folds, and you're next to act with the ace of hearts, eight of hearts. What should you do? Again, in a weak tight game, you should tend to raise more before the flop. Ace-8 suited is a hand that might be a little borderline this early in position, but since the blind is particularly tight and will fold almost all hands to your early raise, you should go ahead and take a shot at this blind. Raise. Now let's try a longer loose passive example. Two players limp, and you're on the button with the ace of hearts, jack of hearts. So you raise. Both blinds call, and the limpers call as well. The flop is ten of hearts, seven of hearts, six of spades. So you have a flush draw on two over cards. Everybody checks to you. What should you do? Pot's large, and you have a great draw with a flush draw on two over cards. You're going to win this pot at least 35% of the time, probably more when you make top pair. If you bet, many players may call since it's a loose and passive game, and therefore you'll have a pot equity edge. Even if they don't call, it'll give you a good chance to take the pot on 4th Street. So you bet on the flop, and two of the players call. The turn is the queen of clubs, so you missed your draw, but it gave you an extra gut shot. The two players check to you. What should you do now? Well, the fact that two loose and passive players called on a 10-7-6 flop doesn't necessarily mean they have very good hands. They could just have a stiff 8 or 9, they could have ace high, they could have a small pocket pair, they could have a lot of hands. You have a very strong draw still, with your flush draw and gut shot. Also, you have a draw to a pair of aces or jacks, which may well be good. Almost half the deck makes your hand, and you have two players who probably don't even have very good hands. The pot is big, so you should bet. Protect your draw, hope they fold. If they don't, hopefully you'll make your draw and win a big pot. The next two examples are from a weak tight shorthanded game, which may well be the most profitable game type possible. So the game is five handed, and the player under the gun, that is two off the button, raises. The next player folds, and you're on the button with king of hearts, ten of spades. What should you do? The typical adjustment you might make in a shorthanded game is to start three betting people slightly more loosely, because most people lower their raising standards because they think that doing so is necessary in a shorthanded game. But when you're playing against weak tight players, you definitely shouldn't do that. King-10 is a huge underdog against a weak tight player raising, whether the game's five-handed or ten. You need to fold. Let's try another one. It's still the five-handed game, and the big blind is a tight and predictable player. Player under the gun raises, and you're on the button, now with pocket aces. Ace of hearts, ace of diamonds. Now what should you do? Normally in weak tight games, you should tend to 3-bet when you have a strong hand, because it puts more pressure on the blind and they're more likely to fold. Also, it gives you those advantages after the flop and it bloats the pot. But that's not true when you have pocket aces. 
Pocket aces is the best hand possible, and your opponents don't know you have it. If they suspect you do, if you 3-bet, then they'll be scared, as they always are, and tend to fold. The big blind will probably fold, and the initial raiser may fold on the flop. With aces, you want action. You don't want people to fold immediately, since your hand is so much better than average. So in this situation, you should probably just call, hope the player in the big blind has something worth calling with, and try to get some action after the flop. Let's go back to a 10-handed loosened passive game. Two players limp, and you're on the button with pocket tens, the ten of hearts and ten of diamonds. Naturally, you raise. Both blinds fold, and only the limpers call. The flop is queen of diamond, nine of hearts, four of hearts. So it puts two hearts on board, and it puts one over card. Two players check to you, so you bet. And both players call. The turn is the six of hearts, completing a possible flush. Notice that you have the ten of hearts. Everybody checks you again. What should you do? Well, against tricky players who like to check-raise, you might check behind here. Because if you do get check-raised, you you're not sure exactly what to do. Your 10 high flush draw may be worth drawing to, but you may be drawing dead against a bigger flush. Furthermore, tricky players are relatively likely to check-raise you, and force you to put in two bets with a hand that's really too weak to do that. Loose and passive players, on the other hand, are far less likely to check-raise. And if you do get check-raised, you might be able to fold if the player who raises you is so passive that he might only check-raise with the nut flush, a possibility with some loose passive players. In any event, you're far less likely to be check-raised in a loose passive game than in a typical one, so it's worth taking another shot to protect your hand. So you bet. One player calls. The river's the two of hearts, so now there are four hearts on board and you have a flush with the ten of hearts. Your opponent checks. What should you do? Again, if you bet against a tricky player, you'd have to pay off a check raise because he might be bluffing. That makes you slightly less inclined to bet. You still might bet depending on the player, but it makes you consider checking. Against a loose and passive player, you shouldn't even consider checking. He's going to call with a lot worse hands, and if he does check raise, he's almost certain to have the nuts. So if you bet, you can fold to a check raise against a loose and passive player, whereas you'd have to call against a tricky one. That makes you more inclined to bet. Since loose and passive players call more and check raise less, this is an easy value bet. Loose and passive and weak tight are just two of many game types. For instance, there's all the aggressive games. But learning to adjust your game to those is exactly the same as learning to adjust your game to loose and passive and weak tight game. Identify the mistakes your opponents make and then set up situations where they'll make those mistakes more often and more costly. Most of your opponents never change, and they make the same errors again and again. If you get the hang of making these adjustments, you'll find that opponents who've been troublesome in the past become nothing but stationary targets.